Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this afternoon's Hangout. Uh, my name is Jonathan Sullivan. I am the Executive Director of Evangelization, Education, and Worship for the Diocese of Lafayette in Indiana. It's my pleasure to welcome you today. Uh, we have a great guest today. Uh, Daniela Jupan Jerome is a professor of pastoral theology at the Notre Dame Seminary in New Orleans, and she's also the author of Connected Toward Communion, the Church and Social Communication in the Digital Age. Uh, and so uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Daniela. Thank you so much, Jonathan, and thank you so much, all of you who are uh, who are here and who'll be watching later. I'm delighted to be part of this conversation for this brief time. And these are always good opportunities um, for me to think through better how I can explain it. So I always love questions and I love the chance to discuss. So you're all doing a service to me. Thank you. <laughs> Great. So before we kind of get into the meat of the conversation, Daniela, I want to ask you first, how you got into theology in general, and specifically how you got interested in this intersection of theology and technology? Sure, uh, that's a great question. So I studied theology all of my career, all of my life. Um, I just got started uh, studying theology as an undergrad at Notre Dame. Um, and I began to understand that the communication of the faith is not just done through texts and volumes and tomes, but it's done also through how our, our worship unfolds, how we have art and physical visible things in our worship spaces, different kinds of media in other words. So I, I continued my studies, I studied liturgy, I got a master's in liturgy and I studied also sacred art and I, I got another master's in sacred art. And I kept thinking of this question, like how do we do the best that we can as a church in communicating the content of our faith. I think I say this every time, every time somebody asks me this, I say it, that I think the content of faith, the tradition, the deposit of faith is so rich, so beautiful, um, so amazing that, you know, we could really sit with that for a life, lifetime. We don't have a lack of content in our church, in our tradition, right? That's not the problem. I think where we have a challenge is doing the best that we can relaying that content, communicating the good news and conveying that so people can understand. So that's the question that continues to fascinate me. And as I studied liturgy, I thought about how we do that in worship, um, in, in, in the arts, I thought about the same question. And then finally I did my doctorate in education because education of course is, is a, a content that holds this question really closely. How do we communicate the content of faith? And as I got my doctorate, um, I, I, I was thinking about catechesis as my main topic, and it just became increasingly evident to me that we're living in a world that is so shaped by communication, especially in and through our digital culture and its practices, that yeah. this is a question that is so relevant. How do we do this in a world it would, in a world today where so much of our interaction is done through screens? I mean, even right now, we have the gift of technology. <laughs> to learn from one another and have a conversation. So it just became an evident thing to me in terms of the world we're living in today to think about this. How do we do this? And how do we do this today in this world with these apps and gadgets and, and different kinds of things? So this is where what I think about. And I guess I would call myself a pastoral theologian, which means that I, I think about the application, the practical application and, and the context and the culture uh, in which we practice our faith that we learn and hold in our heart and pray with. So those are always important questions for me as well. Right. And so it's interesting because I think you're probably young enough that uh, as you were doing your theological studies, a lot of these technologies were just kind of coming into their own, things like Facebook and Twitter and streaming video and all of those things. So it's kind of an interesting intersection, even just time-wise, uh, of, of those two fields coming together for you. The, I would just say it's really hard to write a dissertation, which in the dissertation, you need to find like all the classic sources. And, <laughs> uh, when I, you know, I, I did find some of those, but some of my content had to do with, you know, thinking about digital culture and, and platforms and social media. And I was writing this in like 2008, 2009. So it was hard to find established uh, published homes and classic sources on that in the, in the conventional sense of the word. And wow. then the other thing is that my research becomes so dated so quickly so that <laughs> if I reference some, even in the book that you so graciously held up, I tried not to reference too much like which platforms are popular because um, in a couple of years they become different anyway. So it becomes so dated. And nobody, who, who remembers Friendster or MySpace, right? <laughs> yeah. Kind of platforms. And that wasn't that long ago, but it seems ages ago. So yes, you're right that this topic itself is so fluid, which makes it challenging but it also makes it really interesting at the same time. So it's hard for us to pin it down, but at the same time, it also 
enables us to be in conversation about it because that's the best mm -hmm. way we can kind of try to figure it out putting our heads together and thinking about your experience in mind as this thing continues to move along so rapidly. Yeah. That's great. Uh, so the reason I, I wanted to have this conversation in part is because I have the great opportunity to see you speak at the uh, University of Notre Dame Center for Liturgy Symposium this past summer where you talked about uh, digital culture and the, capacity, the liturgical capacity of the person. I thought it was a, a great talk and I'll put a, a link to that in, in the notes to, to this video. Uh, but just to start us out today, kind of give us just a brief overview of what you mean by digital culture, because that may be a phrase that a lot of people are, are unfamiliar with. Uh, we think about culture, we think about often ethnicity or, or national cultures, things like that. But what is the digital culture? What a great question, and I'm so glad that you're leading with this, because it's one of the things I always hope to convey when I talk <laughs> about this. And I think when I, uh, I think it's so important, because when we're talking about digital culture, very often our minds mind may go to the, the actual artifacts of that, which are the gadgets mm -hmm. and the apps and platforms. So when we're thinking about this in, in, in like a pastoral council meeting or a ministry meeting, how do we do this better? We're often thinking about what app is most popular or what platform are people on? So it goes very quickly to these particular things and artifacts. And I always want to broaden that conversation and say, before we're thinking about the tools and technologies themselves, I think it's important for us as church to think more broadly and to think in terms of culture. So and think of the, the ways that people interact and think and relate and know things today in light of these technologies available to us. So like that human interactive dimension. And yes, the gadgets and the tools are part of that, but they're not the end goal of, our, of this mystery. Mm -hmm. Rather, it's thinking about how do human beings continue to relate with another and, and form community in a world such as ours in which these gadgets exist. So I call that digital culture because that emphasizes the human interactive dimension, which I think is really especially salient for people like you and me thinking about church and ministry. So at the end of our day, we're not, our job is not to think about the best platform or product, but rather how do we bring people into communion with each other and with God, right? And yeah, so that's, it's interesting you say that because I got kind of part of my start in terms of going out and doing pre presentations and stuff was specifically on helping people to set up Facebook pages for yes. parishes and things like that and, and very step-by-step uh, -step how to use the technology things. And I'd often get frustrated uh, because people, exactly like you said, they would focus on the technology, focus on the platform, and not on, all right, what are we using this for? How are we actually creating relationship, building relationships, strengthening relationships with these social communication technologies? Uh, they, they get, yeah, mired down and, all right, what am I going to put on here? How am I going to get this set up? You're right. I think there's, uh, I mean, I, I wouldn't want to, and I, I don't think you're suggesting this either. I think we both agree that's an important question, right? That, oh, absolutely. Right. That I think in our ministries, we do have to grapple with. And very often these, these meetings are about this. Um, but I think what I get concerned and is, is that we can get so caught up in this. And this is a, a fluid, rapidly changing reality in which if we keep, keep trying to keep up with the next innovation, it burns us out. And in fact, we, do, we don't ever succeed at it and we lose sight of the good ministry we could be doing if we just take a step back and think what it, like discern, what are we trying to do? What is this tool or technology allowing us to do in terms of our greater mission? How does this thing bring people into relationship with another? What variety of things can we do? So can we still have a bulletin that's printed? Can we still have face-to-face -face conversations? Like thinking about terms of like an ecology of ways, not just one. Yeah. And I think if we brought it in out as like a cultural question as opposed to technology question, it gives us more freedom to think about these things from that discerning lens and, and, and maybe proceed in ministry with a little bit more confidence and encouragement uh, instead of the, the sense of burnout and overwhelm, like, oh gosh, I don't know, I can't keep up with it, they're expensive, I'm too old for this, right? Like yeah. those things that can kind of burden us. So uh, what are some of the elements of the digital culture then? And kind of thinking yeah. to the kind of classic definition of culture in terms of beliefs, sure. behaviors, things like that. What are some of the elements? Yes, thank you. So that's a good thread to continue. 
And when I gave the talk on this, which you said you would link, um, I talked about culture in these broad terms. And then I also helped us think about what a culture is. Like you said, very often we think of ethnicities. Like I myself, if you catch my accent, I'm Hungarian originally. So you would think, okay, Hungarian culture. But really culture is really the idea of people living together in a particular context or setting and how this communal life unfolds, right? So it's kind of studying that. And that can be defined according to certain things we could look at. And this is, of course, a very uh, broad definition of culture. And those who study culture proper will probably uh, nuance it for me. <laughs> but I think for our purposes, if we think about a culture, any kind of culture, American culture, culture in New Orleans, culture in Lafayette, right? Um, particular set of, of things that it values. That culture has a particular set of things that it believes in, its assumptions. That culture has a particular set of practices that make it distinctive. And that culture may have a particular set of artifacts or tools or things that make it distinctive as well. So we can take these things, values and beliefs and practices and artifacts and think about digital culture as well and, and begin to kind of highlight some things that make that distinctive and help us think about how to approach it for ministry for life of faith. So for example, in terms of values of digital culture, what are some of the things that are valued in a world such as ours with these tools and uh, communication technologies available to us? Well, and Jonathan, add, add to this too, if you think of some things, but for sure. example, think of this uh, and some of the things that are especially valued, I think of things like innovation that the newer things are, the, the better they are generally, that they're accepted. So mm -hmm. the latest update, the latest model, the latest gadget is always perceived as better, right? So uh, one value is a sense of newness, a sense of innovation. Another value I think of is a sense of participation that in, especially through social media, we value the fact that many people have a voice and at least a possibility of contribution if they choose to, that that, that, that gate is open. And so mm -hmm. we value the fact that that's, that we can chime in and leave comments and it's not just a one-way broadcast model anymore. So we appreciate that. And we can even use it for silly, silly purposes, like <laughs> just jokes or emojis or something. But the fact that we can is something that we appreciate and value. Another thing along those lines, I think we value as a culture is collaboration in, in the same vein that when somebody puts up something and contributes something that other people can add or augment or share or challenge and kind of be in conversation around that content and in fact shape that content together mm -hmm. so one example i would think of is, is cooking and recipes i like to make things i like to bake and, and stuff and um when one finds a recipe online you know the traditional re recipes there maybe a video maybe a picture yeah. and then the ingredients and the steps you have to do and nowadays i don't know if you all do this who are listening or maybe jonathan but I always look at the comments as well. Yes, yes. And say, okay, well, how did this actually work out? And this one person would say, well, I left it in five minutes longer and it was better. Or I left out this ingredient, but added that. Yeah. Or for me, you know, this didn't work, but this other thing did. And for me, that in a way, that collaboration of voices becomes part of the recipe almost. Like, and in fact, whenever we purchase anything, we tend to oh, look at the comments, the reviews first, right? Mm -hmm. on Amazon or other marketplaces. And that almost helps us make the decision rather than just the pitch itself or whatever it is. So we, help, we value collaboration and we kind of find authenticity in the fact that these voices are involved. And I guess maybe I would also add another value. And of course you can add some too if you think of some, uh, and that of creativity. That of people having the freedom to play and create and put things up. And whether it's a picture, whether it's a, something they compose on a blog, their creative thoughts, or their, their musings, or videos, or artwork, or Etsy, things they make, their <laughs> sell. So we, we tend to put a value on people uh, making things, doing things in a, also in a DIY fashion. You know, we see this mm -hmm. also offline, not just on the computer, but more and more DIY shows, more and more do-it-yourself, maker movement type things. I think that's another value of our, our culture as digital. I don't know if you, you would add anything here. Yeah, I, I think one I would add also, and it's related to all of those in a way, is uh, self-expression and especially being able to form your own digital identity. I know Sherry Turkle talks about that a lot in, in her work, right. that people use digital spaces to try on different parts of their personality, to become someone they're not, uh, whether that's in gaming spaces or something like Second Life or uh, even in, in Facebook, you know, you'll often have a different personality online than you will uh, in, in real life as it is. 
I think part of that too is connected to, I don't know if this is a value so much as it is a belief, uh, is a further dissociation of the mind and the body. Mm, of, mm. And we can talk about maybe a little bit uh, about what that means for, for us in our incarnational theology <laughs> in a bit. Uh, but I, I think there's you know a further separation uh, of that kind of dualism between the two that uh, is spilling over even into real life. And I, I have kind of a uh, half-baked theory that that's part of the reason that body modification has become so popular is because it's just a physical expression of what people are used to doing in digital spaces. That's right. That's well said. That this screen that we have in front of us kind of gives a shelter sometimes. Mm -hmm. And that shelter leaves us to be less inhibited in some ways, which, as you say, leads to self-expression and, and like a healthy exploration of who we are and, and a freedom to play. Almost like a little, like a, a moratorium, a place to play. Mm. Yeah. With who we are. And I could also see that going in a more harmful direction where we have screens in front of us and we forget that there's a person there on the other side. So we could be less inhibited in our communication and become more violent in some ways mm. too, which we also see happening. And that too has to do with your good point about this division between um, sort of our psychosocial entity and then the body and our situatedness in a place and a time, you know? So I think yeah. that's a very interesting thing and, and definitely worth uh, more conversation further on. Um, okay. Maybe I'd say a word about beliefs, too. So we talk about yeah. values, beliefs, and these are akin to um, what we talked about before. So we believe in this cultural context that newer is better. Uh, we believe, I think, and I see this more and more, and I wonder what you think of this, too, Jonathan, um, that, that belonging to a conversation and having a chance to have a voice and sometimes emote or just add to the flow is sometimes more important than the concrete content itself that is being communicated. And sometimes even the truthfulness of that content. So sometimes we get, tend to get swept up in movements um, just to share the opinion uh, without necessarily looking into the full article <laughs> that we're sharing, <laughs> its nuances and what does this actually mean? Uh, but rather we get swept up in the wave of whatever that the topic is trending, right? So uh, sometimes that's for the good and sometimes that could be really helpful uh, or harmful actually. So belonging to the conversation is highly valued, I think, even over content sometimes. Uh, but in, in a, innocuous ways too, we see this. Like people get really excited about a cat video or animals <laughs> doing cute things, you know, which is just really like innocuous content, like something silly. But the fact that we're in connection about it and that you give me a thumbs up and then I send it to somebody else else like that's what makes it meaningful sure i'll, I'll share a story uh, also, I don't know. go ahead uh, the day i got twitter the day i got twitter uh <laughs> this was oh i don't know 2009 maybe i'd been on twitter for a year or so and i just hadn't gotten it but i was still playing around with it i was sitting in bed in the morning kind of scrolling through and the local news channel i was very very good at the time about putting up here's some of our upcoming stories here's what the weather's going to be and that particular morning they also had uh, and join us at such and such time, so-and-so is going to be joining us with three recipes involving bacon. Because, of course, bacon's a big thing online. Uh, <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I responded uh, and just said something like, mmm, bacon. You know, just a, a silly, like you said, innocuous little response to, to this tweet. Uh, and they, they, they responded, we love bacon, too. At Sully Joe, we love bacon, too. And it was that moment of connection that... A moment of conversation that made me realize, oh, you know what, there's actually someone behind that account, and we've just shared a moment about bacon. And that's kind of what got me interested in that. Okay, so what kind of moments can I have about faith with people online? That's Particularly right. for my ministry, yeah. talking about, you know, what kind of catechists and catechetical leaders are online sharing information. That's where I started to meet all these great people online that were sharing all of their catechetical resources and ideas and, uh, mm -hmm. and the different conversations. So absolutely, it, it can be absolutely innocuous, uh, in addition mm -hmm. to a lot of these other uh, much larger issues that we see, uh, which, and I think you're right that there's a good aspect to that. And also uh, sometimes an easy activism that we feel like just by hitting a like or sharing something that we've done something uh, when really it's not much of an investment in self. And I think that can, that can cause us to think we've contributed or think that we've uh, uh, stood up for this issue when, when really we haven't done all that much. It, it creates an easy out for us in the way that we interact in, in the wider society. Mm -hmm. You're right, I think, um, what does it mean to really serve? What does it mean to be really active or engage with something? And I think it could be the case that someone really reads a content piece and really are behind it and they do reflect on it and they discern whether it's appropriate and then they share it. Mm -hmm. 
And then another person could just look at the headline and say, this looks good, right? Yeah. So yeah. there's a behind it too, but you're right. I'll share with you briefly, since you shared your, your Twitter immersion, I'll share mine. <laughs> okay. Uh, and it's not about bacon, it's about Pope Francis. So I wasn't <laughs> on, on, on Twitter at all, because I thought, you know, social media can be quite overwhelming. And I'm also a person that is deep into spirituality, deeply yearns for silence. I'm a Benedictine oblate. Mm. Okay. Some of these things, like, there's another side of myself. I study this, but I also yearn for some of that. So I thought one was enough. And then Pope Benedict resigned. <laughs> and Pope <laughs> Benedict's resignation, of course, happened in the middle of the day. And um, I, I began seeing postings on, on Facebook. And uh, if I would have been on Twitter, I would have known about this. So I was like, oh, I, I got to be on these things because that's how you learn the ecclesial news nowadays. you know. So I signed up for Twitter so as not to miss major papal announcements. Um, and... One of the first things I remember uh, witnessing on Twitter was Pope Francis' election. Mm -hmm. And I share this story frequently when I talk about this, that when the day Pope Francis was elected, I was in a staff meeting all day, all day, one of those. And of course, it's a conclave, so I want to know what's happening. So I was looking at Twitter while during the meeting to see the hashtag at conclave, what's happening. And when the name was announced, I, I mean, the whole time leading up to it. People excited, people talking about the seagull that sat in the chimney. <laughs> yes, I remember. <laughs> Everyone's it's just so positive, like positive, exciting things scrolling down my screen. And then the name in all caps, Bergoglio. And I thought, this is mind blowing. Like this is sacred space. You know, who are these people? But they're, you know, just all these people from around the world. And there they are, these little cyber entities and on my screen, excited about the Pope. And I was, part, I felt like I was part of that, even though I'm sitting in a conference room all day. So I thought this was amazing. This is mind blowing and uh, it has such good potential. I'll also add this though, and yeah. I share this sometimes in talks that um, I also continued of course to follow Pope Francis on Twitter at Pontifex. And I don't often see that kind of convergence of sacred space and cyberspace. I see a lot of violent comments and I see it sometimes vitriolic words um, mm. in that space. And so that's something I really think about a lot. I actually have an article coming out on that fairly soon. Um, on how do we, what do we do with that in, in these spaces where we have freedom for such good and such positive and such enriching and exciting things, but also such vile, evil ugliness. And the human person really has like, it's like, it's like the, the Bible passage, choose life, you have a choice before you today. Like, what do you choose? You know, this technology allows us to, to do both. Um, so anyway, that's my first Twitter story, but um, I thought I would share that. I, I feel like I'm off topic with you. So tell me where to pick up. No, so I think a good place probably to go next would be, so we've talked about some of the beliefs, some of the values of the digital culture. What do we as ch yeah. church do with these things? <laughs> uh, because I think we've already started pointing out some ways in which, yeah, they're, they can be very, very good uh, and can contribute a lot to the life of faith and to our, our general life together as, as people on this planet. Uh, but as you said, there's there's lots of opportunities for using these, these tools and these technologies for uh, grave evil, and you know you see that a lot nowadays, especially with Twitter really wrestling with uh, how to curb abuse, especially around uh, abuse towards uh, women and women in very public situations who tend to just, uh, as, as soon as they get known in the news, they, they tend to have to drop off of Twitter just because of all the comments and things like that. But it, it's not just a problem on Twitter, it's a problem all over the place. Uh, so what, what do we as church do with this? Uh, you know, in my work, I've seen responses uh, going everywhere from, you know, we got to be there. It's where the people are at. We're going to invest ourselves fully into it to uh, we don't want anything to do with this because we can't control it. And because we don't want to uh, inadvertently even lead people towards those kinds of, uh, those kinds of negative experiences online. So, so what do we as church do? How do we help our people to uh, live the faith in a way that acknowledges this, but also make sure that we're mitigating damage? That's well said. That's a great question. I, I think that's a long response. And that response <laughs> involves the, the input and the participation of, of not just you and me, but people who are continuing to think through this. But I'll add a couple of things to it. Um, I think what do we do as church about this is, first of all, think about who we, who we are and whose we are mm -hmm. and how does communication serve us in general. So whether we're thinking about so like with the question of a, a Twitter or a Facebook, I think I would like step back five steps first and think about why are we even called to be communicators? What does this mean in terms of evangelization? What, how, how is that part of our identity as church? So if we're called to be an evangelizing church, 
and all that we do communicates the good news of Jesus Christ. I think we must at some point take communication technologies seriously because I think there's a, there's a mandate that calls us to do that on some level, okay? Yeah. Now, how a particular com community carries that out, that takes more particular discernment, but just have the recognition of our ecclesiology, our own evangelization to know that, you know, we gotta take this seriously and for better or for worse. Uh, another thing is discernment. And this sermon, I'm using this in a good Jesuit sense of calling in, calling in the Holy Spirit to really, or be open to the, like, as if you have to call the Holy Spirit, but like, be open, <laughs> be open to the work of the Spirit in this endeavor. I always like to say that whenever the authentic communication of the faith takes place, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. It's the Spirit that gives us the ability to speak, to give us the word, so that the word could be illuminated and understood by others. I'm thinking of Pentecost here in the back of my head. <laughs> Communication is always the work of the Holy Spirit. So for us to be spiritually disposed to the work of the Holy Spirit to guide our communication is very important, which of course is, is, is um, interior life prayer, also communal prayer, and to take our concerns for communication to the Holy Spirit and. Uh, really to be in a disposition and not just have that be like, oh, sure, we think about the Holy Spirit, but really have that be a spiritual discipline that we engage in. Um, and I also would think about not just the spirit, but the word, the incarnation of the word, which is a paradigm of thinking about Christ coming and dwelling with us, right? So mm -hmm. the word is a, is a communication term, the incarnation of the word. And to reflect on the incarnation and think about how the incarnation of Christ can teach us to be better communicators. How was he a communicator? Before he said stuff and preached and wrote in the sand and like healed people, how did he actually embody communication? How is his fact of being already God's mm -hmm. communication to us? What does that mean? And how can we emulate that? How can we live that better as, as people who are made in the image and likeness of God and as Christians, people who put on his name? So the incarnation of the word. So I, I really start with theology and spirituality and ecclesiology, <laughs> right? But I think, and that's, so that's why this is a longer conversation, but to really intentionally think about that, like how does our Lord illuminate this question? How does the spirit illuminate this question? And then also how do people who've gone before us in faith illuminate this question? So to look at people all throughout history, the church has always used media to communicate the faith. Um, we've had catacomb paintings <laughs> from the 300s. <laughs> we have illuminated codices. We have um, church, church, church architecture. And then closer to our, our time, we have Fulton Sheen. We have Mother Angelica. We have a Bishop Barron, now Bishop Reed. So there's, there's a cloud of witnesses that help us think about this. Um, so I think someone was listening to me out there right now thinking, well, thanks a lot for a pastoral meeting. This doesn't give any agenda. <laughs> Um, what I would really invite, yeah, you're right, because this is where you need to call in the consultant. But I would, what I would do is like invite you to a retreat and to mm. find your grounding and find your stability in this aspect of the tradition, because all of the rest of it changes so quick. And if we can think through what it means to an authentic Christian Catholic communicator, what does that mean from our tradition, from our faith, from whom we understand God to be, then I think we can more readily face the fluidity of the rest of it right? So yeah. I would start with that. I would start with that. Yeah, I often tell people, uh, you know, don't trust anyone who calls themselves an expert in these things. Because like you said, it, it's just too fluid. There's, there's new things coming every day. And no one's an expert. We're all figuring these things out day by day, week by week, uh, wrestling with. And like you said, I, I think you're exactly right to say start with prayer and spirituality. Mm -hmm. uh, because if we're not grounded in these things ourselves, then there's no way we're going to be able to use these tools uh, as an effective way of communicating the word. Uh, I also think your your point about incarnation, I think, is spot on uh, because it's number one, because it's just such a distinctive thing about Christianity in general, and especially Catholicism with our focus on incarnation and sacramentality and the, the physicalness of the, the world. Uh, one way in which I, I, I love seeing that lived out in terms of the digital space is anytime I get to meet someone that I know online in a face-to-face -face setting. That's always a, a great joy to finally be able to put flesh on the person that has just been pixels on the screen up until then. Uh, you know, it, it, it's a small, silly kind of way to think about incarnation in digital space, but it's one that's been very important to me uh, as I get to meet these folks. That's well said. And I think there's a really important distinction, um, which one of my dear colleagues, who's a Maltese scholar, Nadia Delicata, helped me think about. And we very often talk about how this, this technology is disembodied, okay? Mm -hmm. And we're disembodied. Well, I don't 
think we're disembodied. I mean, we're still sitting in chairs or standing somewhere. Our fingers are still on keyboards and on screens. So the body continues to be involved. There's always a body, right? Mm -hmm. I, I always joke and say, if you've parked yourself in front of your computer for a work day, and then you get up and your back hurts and your eyes hurt, you know this is not a disembodied technology. <laughs> I mean, this thing works upon our bodies in a way that you know, it's painful sometimes. So we're not talking about this embodied. I think what we're talking about sometimes is this incarnate. This mm -hmm. incarnate meaning not being cognizant of the principle of the incarnation, which means the word became flesh to dwell among us and to speak to us in ways we can understand and to invite us into relationship. So how can we communicate with each other, even if it's through a screen that recognizes one another as full human beings, strives to encounter one another in, in the proper ways that we can or endeavor to um, and invite relationship and true uh, encounter and communion out of that in the ways that they might unfold. I mean, that, that is an incarnational principle um, that could happen through Facebook or whatever, right? If there's an attentiveness to the person, a mutual attentiveness to persons being involved. And I think sometimes we don't see that because we rush through or we just see, we just see their little symbols. We see words and sounds and, and pictures on the screen screen and we forget there's a whole person there mm. with that and I think with that we're approaching more so the principle of the incarnation I think that's a great distinction to make uh, and I love that focus on intentionality because you're exactly right so many of these things you know I, I sometimes scare people I'll bring a tweet deck up uh, on my computer because you know I follow literally thousands of people and people see that screen just racing by with all the tweets uh, and yeah there is kind of a uh, an in, unintentionality to that, uh, to have all those people. And, and certainly I've been unintentional about how many people I follow with things like that. Uh, so yeah, reminding ourselves that, yeah, there really is a person behind that and we need to be attentive to the person, even if they're just being represented to us as, as pixels and images. That's right, amen, praise God to that. <laughs> so any last words of wisdom for folks out in the field and parishes and Catholic schools about yeah. uh, the digital culture and, and our role in it? Yes, my word of wisdom is always this. If you have not treated yourself to the document of St. John Paul II called the rapid development from 2005, then particularly in a moment when you're feeling overwhelmed about digital technology, treat yourself to that document. It's one of the most beautiful documents, I think. And it's, I, it might be one of his last, actually, because it was mm -hmm. written in 2005, some months before he died. And he addresses it up to communicators, people who are in charge of communication. And it's the most beautiful pastoral letter that ends with, do not be afraid, mm. which is his phrase that he made, Jesus' <laughs> phrase, of course, that he made famous so many times. And he tells us as his closing thought, do not be afraid, do not be afraid of new technologies, do not be afraid to try and fail, do not be afraid to put these to use and to trust in the Holy Spirit. And that I'm a little bit tearing up right now. I always talk about that document with such, uh, um, such um, uh, emotion because I just imagine at the end of his life and that was like maybe his parting thought to us, you know, mm -hmm. after his life's work. So that's my, that's my parting thought to you. If you're especially overwhelmed and you're thinking about like, where is this theologically, spiritually, to sit down with that short little document and treat yourself to it one day. And I promise you that it's inspiring. Wonderful. Great word of wisdom there. Daniela, thank you so much for joining me today for this conversation. I want to recommend again your book, Connected Toward Communion, which I think is a, a great way for people to enter into this conversation. You do a great job of laying out the church's teaching, and especially talking about how we form people in a lot of these ideas uh, to, to use technology well for the good of the church. So thank you so much. God bless you and your ministry down at Notre Dame Seminary, and I hope we get to see each other again sometime soon. Yes, many blessings, and thank you for all the good that you do, and I'm honored to be asked to be part of the conversation. Thank you. All right, thanks. And again, I will have links to a lot of the resources we've talked about in the description of this video. Thank you all for watching, and God bless you as well.